work for the NHS. You've had a great idea, you've made it happen, and it's made a big difference to how we can learn from COVID-19 and enter a new normal. Ideas like yours drive improvement and they deserve to be shared. That's what Bob does. Amplifying good ideas like yours across the NHS so as many people as possible can learn from, adapt and implement your idea. The further good ideas are shared by the Bob community who learn from them, the greater improvement we can achieve. You made a change. Share your solution with others. Speak to Bob. everybody uh, to uh, our final session of today on the uh, Bob track, which is all about spreading and scaling of innovation and improvement in the NHS. Um, we're very much focused in on that topic uh, here today in the room. Um, I, my name is Neil Crump. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Bob.Health and I've got two tremendous speakers, um, uh, people I really respect uh, what they think and what they say. Um, so I've got Hugh and Rob. Um, who we're going to talk about how we drive improvement and innovation, um, the adoption of those to achieve spread and scale within the NHS. So um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a second. But first of all, I've just got a couple of little things I wanted to run through. So um, first of all, I just wanted to make a, a distinction between um, sort of homegrown improvement, and um, which doesn't really have any external support or sort of extra things going into it versus um, innovation, which is potentially my definition for this session is sort of privately funded things that are introduced into this system to help make the change happen. So I'm not saying that improvement isn't innovative, but there are some distinctions between, you know, uh, making improvements to the system and then introducing an innovation into the system, which is something that's been, ex that's been externally developed and being brought in. So um, the other thing I just wanted to run through is uh, we have a poll. Um, so I'm just wanted to see if that's come, coming up. Uh, I don't see it there yet. So what we'll do is I will, um, I will skip the poll for the minute. I'll come back to that. Um, but what I would ask you to do is um, we are, there were some tweet, people tweeting. So you can uh, tweet on the hashtag giant2020. And the hashtag for our track is unpack the how. So unpack the how with a hashtag in front. And Bob's Twitter account is bob.health uh, with spelled B O B D O T health. So uh, spell out the word dot. Um, so um, please join us on the conversation there. So, Hugh, how are you? <laughs> um, I'm good. Thank you, Neil. Lovely. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So if you could just um, introduce yourself, um, tell everyone about your current role and remit, and maybe just the, your career path to how you got into this role. Okay, thank you, Neil. Uh, my name's Hugh McCacky. I'm the National Director of Improvement. Uh, I started this post about 18 months ago uh, in uh, April last year. Uh, little did I know it would pan out uh, the way it has. And uh, certainly the, the role has changed probably quite significantly from what I saw at the outset. Prior to this role, I was a chief exec in uh, an integrated trust, uh, health and social care trust in Northern Ireland. And indeed had been working for probably the tr previous 25 years at sort of board level and various posts. My particular interest and in fact passion is about uh, patient safety and, and improvement and essentially making services safer and better. That was my particular interest and bent. Uh, in the 10 years prior to this post, I was a chief exec um, in a trust and uh, I spent that 10 years trying to embed an improvement approach uh, into the organization. And I said at the outset of, of uh, when I was appointed, in fact, I said at my inter interview, if you appoint me, 
uh, I will want to change the way we judge success and try and build a different way, which had improvement embedded into the organization. And uh, that's what we spent 10 years doing. And our results were really good. We, we, we didn't set out to fix performance, but by embedding an improvement approach in culture, we moved to being sort of first or second in virtually everything in Northern Ireland. Our reference costs were low. Um, it, it, our staff satisfaction results were really high. I think the biggest single impact was probably the culture change and uh, where um, staff right across the organization felt uh, they had the skills, uh, they felt empowered, they felt they had permission to try and make their bit of the service safer and better. And we had a little mantra, which um, is one which I, I sort of brought with me, but so there were 10,000 staff in the organization. And we used to say regularly that the idea that the top sort of um, 20 or 30 people had all the answers and could see all the solutions is a nonsense. And actually, if we could harness the 10,000 minds or the 10,000 pairs of eyes to see how we could make our services better, we would be much more powerful. And um, that's essentially what we set out to do, which was to try and change the culture and the whole approach in the organization. Not long before I left, I visited a ward where um, every band three was trained and was leading a, a, an improvement project. So your, your sort of healthcare assistant or your uh, that, that sort of level was leading um, and felt empowered to do it. And the sense of satisfaction people get from that. So in long story short um in essence the reason i took up this job was to see can you do that can we do it with 1.3 million people can we embed an improvement approach in culture right across the nhs in england because i think a lot of our frontline staff frontline staff feel beleaguered feel like uh, there's an awful heavy uh, focus on assurance in our system and i think we need to rebalance that with a culture of improvement so people we go back to people feeling they can they have the skills and they're celebrated and supported whenever they they make their service safer and better that's amazing and um i i will pick up i i had not picked up on the fact that uh, your previous experience was integrated health and social care so maybe i might pick on that and if actually anyone in the audience has any questions about that integration so obviously we're not terribly good at that within uh, England uh, I think better in Scotland and obviously in Northern Ireland but um, if anyone has any questions about social care and how you link that in um, please send those in so thank you so now Rob uh, Berry would you like to introduce yourself your role and how you got to this post certainly thank you Neil thank you for inviting me to be part of today's session uh, so I'm called the Head of Innovation in Kent, Surrey and Sussex Academic Health Science Network. Uh, what that means in practice is I spend a lot of time talking to companies. Um, uh, so myself and a small team deal with the sort of first contacts of companies who approach uh, RAHSN. And we provide uh, twice monthly briefings, a little bit about uh, the NHS, some of the challenges you'll face. Uh, the sort of support services AHSN might give you and how we might signpost you to different agencies and programs across the uh, innovation landscape. Uh, there's one of me per 15 AHSNs that covers England. Uh, collectively, we're known as the Commercial Directors Forum. Uh, in that sort of forum, we pick up some of the national work. So I'm involved in uh, what's called the Programme Development Group. This is looking at out of those 15 AHSNs, uh, interventions that have been developed locally uh, may have a national application, so we're involved in collating and curating those to turn them into national programmes. Uh, in that role, I've supported the drafting of a framework around real-world evaluation, real-world validation, which I'm going to talk about in more detail later on, but an essential step to supporting scale-up. I've been involved in the Small Business Research Initiative, uh, as a board member, it's a NHS England programme that invests about 10 million a year uh, to develop new uh, technologies uh, to address known challenges. Um, and I'm also involved in helping the Accelerated Access Review, sorry, Accelerated Access Collaborative, um, develop innovator services um, nationally. Now, how did I get into this? So some years ago, my, not quite 30, 
Um, I joined the NHS at Great Ormond Street Hospital and, and worked in typically a, acute provider organisations for about 17 years. And in that role, it's a general management role, supporting frontline uh, services and support services, clinical and non-clinical, to improve. So often this comes down to understanding how a decision is made, uh, how are the books balanced in order to support those changes. Um, shortly after uh, leaving, I think, as a guys in St Thomas's, I was working in the Strategic Health Authority in the southeast coast, as it was called then, uh, similar territory to Kent, sorry, in Sussex that I'm in now. Uh, and then uh, three years after that, started in an academic health science network. I was involved in the development of the uh, guidance that supported the national rollouts, so involved in some stakeholder engagement uh, around the development of AHSNs and have been there for the last eight years. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And um, I just want to say thank you to Rob, uh, because he has been very helpful um, with Bob um, and helping us to sort of navigate the system and giving us some great advice along the way. So um, he and his team have been brilliant and um, we enjoy working with them. So thank you for being here, Rob. Um, so the poll is, in fact, working. Um, so the question on the poll is um, and you can access the poll. Uh, there's a button that you'll see that says poll. Uh, next to the chat button. And uh, the question is, why is experience sharing about improvement and innovations option so hard in practice within the NHS? So why is that so hard? There are four options. Um, people are busy. Uh, there's no standard way to share. Uh, what is shared lacks practical tips and staff move on. So you've only got four options. But if you have other ideas, um, please drop that into the chat. So if, if it doesn't fit those four, um, drop it into the chat and we'll see what comes up there and see what that, um, uh, what that uh, reveals for us. So let's um, have a look. Uh, let's uh, move on. And uh, we have two uh, presentations from each of our speakers. So Hugh is going to go first. So uh, Hugh, uh, if you'd like to kick us off with your presentation, have a reflection, and then we'll go on to Rob's presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, I don't know whether people in, in the sort of audience um, know, but I, I, I'm presenting without being able to see my own slides in real time. So uh, I shall, I, I'm working off a sort of a separate screen, sort of hard copy. Uh, so hopefully if I, I uh, move off sync, uh, somebody, Neil, can tell me and, and uh, I'll get back on sync with the slides in case I'm talking to a slide and you're looking at a different one. Um, it's interesting, Neil, your question there, you, you gave four areas. I think there's another one which is actually around almost the cultural aspect. And I think it's part of, links to part of what I was um, saying. Uh, earlier on, which is around how do we build and links to the title, I suppose, of my talk, which is how do we actually build an NHS which is um, keen to share, one where we encourage and value sharing of innovation and ideas that work, and actually that we, we put a high value on adopting things that work. Because I, 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 I know we were talking just beforehand this, and I'm talking about one of my sort of ambitions is to create an award for harvesters or adopters that um, we, we have lots of awards for people who do the innovation or who do something for the first time. But actually, I think part of the issue for the NHS is not that we don't have the solutions, we don't have the innovations, but we take so long to spread them. And we actually are not good at getting that comprehensive scale and spread uh, and the potential benefits that could be realized if we were much better at scaling, uh, at sharing, um, at borrowing and taking ideas from elsewhere. Because I almost think we're culturally where, whether it's from the market, the years of the market and competition, that we're keen to hide our innovations and ideas. Um, but also we're not necessarily receptive to receiving them. And I think we've got to relearn a behavior which is very much that we're keen, we're hungry to harvest and adopt things that work from elsewhere. And I suppose that links to my um, title slide, which I mentioned uh, in terms of my Twitter handle, I'm passionate about making services safer and better. 
and I think at a national level, and I, deliberately the title is about driving improvement and innovation adoption. So the key word is about adoption um, to achieve scale and spread. And uh, there is something around, I think, building, rebuilding that culture and some of the systems uh, and showing that we value that, um, uh, that approach and behavior of actually adopting things that work. So we move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> which is, and I, I want to sort of use this very relevant example. It, it's entitled Approach, Adopt and Adapt. And it's a very relevant example. I'm not going to go into the, all the detail of it, but it was the process we used um, in uh, through the sort of um, early uh, stages in the, or in the last few months as part of the sort of uh, recovery uh, from wave one and was um, what we had termed uh, was a term the adopt and adapt um, process but essentially is a rapid improvement cycle um, where on the basis of a sort of pulling together the knowledge we have and the ideas we have around a challenge taking one area in in this case um, we had an, each region taking one area um, whether it was outpatients whether it was uh, theatres, whether it was um, diagnostics, <clears throat> and working up what was the best way, what needed to be done to maximise our recovery, uh, and involving the relevant uh, uh, ICSs, STPs, and local systems, and developing a sort of blueprint solution, a sort of uh, what we felt was a plan, if you like, out of that uh, piece of work, but then sharing and collaborating that with the other regions. So that um, the work done in, for instance, the Northwest on outpatients, that blueprint, we didn't have seven consecutive or seven sort of um, uh, workshops going on at the same time, trying to find the sort of same solutions uh, to the same problem and potentially coming up with slightly different. But we had one it done in one area <clears throat> potentially, and we did have with some where other other regions attended or other systems attended. And then we we shared that and had a system for sharing that, and uh, had but had built in the sort of local ability to adapt that to a local circumstance. So it may be very different in the southwest, or it may have some difference in the southwest from London, for instance. Um, uh, but the overriding principle was one where we were collaborating and sharing, so that we were finding building on the improvements and building on the plan rather than. Re reworking and finding uh, the same solution a second time. If we could move on to the next slide, which would be entitled the Improvement Directorate. Um, and th this is a piece of work I've, we've sort of been doing over the last number of months to say, well, what is the role of the um, National Improvement Directorate um, uh, in a sort of post-COVID world and looking at what are the big objectives for us? And I I've <clears throat> essentially distilled this into three areas. Um, the first being the sort of recovery piece. How do we actually use the skills, the improvement skills that we have? Um, and particularly we have a, a sort of lead role around diagnostics and outpatients. How do we use that sort of um, work, things from the national outpatients program and diagnostics program? Uh, and how do we use the other sort of work we're doing with areas like GERFT, for instance? Um, to help recovery um, and a big part of that is sharing the learning around what works, um, sharing the innovations, sharing the improvements that we know um, will work, using data to identify where those opportunities exist um, and then supporting the local um, area and systems uh, with that recovery. The second area is it is entitled, as you can see, productivity. But this is this is a bit like you, know, you will remember. Some of you will remember the sort of the artist formerly known as Prince. Um, well, this is the sort of um, uh, national program formerly known as Productivity, because um, I think at this time, if you talk to frontline staff about productivity, it means you know cost cutting. It means um, sort of taking money out. Uh, it means sort of driving already busy people even harder uh, because we have to get our productivity up. But in actual fact, um, the, I believe the approach to um, which works is if we focus our attention on getting 
uh, if you like, that that embedding um, improvement uh, and embedding pathways much more consistently. And it's interesting, I, I know one of the questions you were sort of asking was around the sort of difference between improvement and innovation or, um, and there's, I think with innovation, it's, some of you may well have read black box thinking, a big bit of the black box thinking is when you're innovating, you increase variation to try and find the things that work. And actually when you're um, embedding, improve, you know, using improvement tools, you're often, and in particularly with the productivity approach, is what you're trying to do is embed the right way of doing it much more consistently because that's that's a big part of our problem is not that we don't know what the best pathway is or the best care is but we don't do it all the time so how do we are we much more successful at embedding the right way of doing things and if we do that we remove waste in the form of harm unnecessary steps unnecessary tasks for staff uh, unnecessary interventions unnecessary treatments and that has a very significant impact um, and it, it, it gives us better quality, better outcomes, better patient experience, uh, but also releases time for staff and it's by reducing the variation in our pathways and that's in essence what the, the big central piece of that um, uh, program nor formerly known as productivity. Uh, and we will find a better title. Uh, it'll be something like Pathways to Better Health or something like that, but um, we need to actually build a program around that, and uh, that's what we'll be doing over the next number of months. And the third area, which I'm not going to go into, is the what we would term recovery support or the old special measures. But for me, a lot of that is in, are pinned by um, a range of areas around data, measurement, tools, um, and things we have learnt over the past six months, eight months through this period. But ultimately, it is about embedding a continuous improvement approach uh, as the norm. That can we spread that this this approach to 1.3 million and people and really embed it right across the system. So moving to the next um, slide, which is clarity on focus and responsibilities at each system level. And I, I'm not going to go into this, but I think we have a grid. You can see there that I think at each level uh, there is a different role and responsibility in this. And, uh, I think we have to move, and I think there's a real opportunity um, with the the moving into a system uh, led by systems, if you like, system leadership, and having um, bringing together providers, uh, commissioners, uh, local authorities, agencies, um, into a, a system led approach. I think offers us great opportunity. I don't believe that actually structures uh, deliver results. But I think a structure which can help uh, or can inhibit you from delivering results. And I think this this structure um, will give us greater potential where nationally, instead of trying to introduce things or trying to, to scale things to 230 providers and then potentially um, primary care and other areas, instead, actually that's been led by the 40 or so systems and actually i think the, the spans of uh, control become much more manageable so i think at a national level our role is not to mandate not to try and direct and manage into the the system but is actually to create the the opportunity to set the tone to clarify the big objectives and to create the framework for that to happen uh, and as you can see that that then percolates down to each level if we move on to the next slide, which is sort of um, is a slide taken uh, out of the sort of and it's entitled "Overview Our Approach from the National Outpatients Transformation Program," and uh, I, I think it sort of captures what we're trying to do now at a national level is not to mandate here is the way to do it, but is actually creating the guidance, the tools, the resources. Um, uh, and bringing together the relevant stakeholders to, to help to um, identify what are the optimum pathways, what are the tools that are useful, what is the best practice, who's doing well, what are they doing, how can we create the framework for that to be shared. And then if you like the middle box is around the, uh, the implementation of that and testing of it, the local adaptation has to be based at a local system level. Uh, and then on the right hand side is is very much the sort of um, basing that in a number of specialties where we will prototype. And I think for me, um, the approach we're likely to take next year is is focusing on a small number of specialties, but trying then to, to really get because 
it, this isn't just we haven't done it before. No country has really internationally yet has embedded, um, taken a system of embedding pathways and made it work at scale. And so what we want to do is actually sort of model this and prototype it at two or three uh, specialties or pathways so that we can actually demonstrate that the methodology works. And I think the time has never been better uh, to do it. If we could move on to the, the next slide, which will be very briefly, and, it, and it's a sort of, uh, it's a graphic. And for me, this is how will this work is now at, at um, four levels. Um, the first, which I shared with actually a group this morning, and, and they probably quite rightly said the digital transformation piece at the top should actually probably be right at the bottom and underpinning everything we do. Um, I, I sort of described it as overarching, but actually I think there's a strong argument that it's underpinning. We need digital um, the, to use the digital tools uh, to enable us um, to make the transformation we want right across the system, and it, but it, it should be embedded as business as usual. The second level, which is that what I've just been talking about, the national programs or interventions and optimum practice um, guidance. And I think in the past, each one of those boxes, the sort of workforce diagnostics, outpatients, the national programs have all been working in, you know, in silos. So we try to manage the diagnostics down into the system across 230 providers or, or um, cancer down in across all the, the, the system. And actually, if you're on the receiving end, you have all these national programs and optimal guidance coming at you. And the ability, our ability then to get those, all of those things embedded um, has been effectively um, compromised and, and hasn't been that successful. The third level is actually what we're intending to do is uh, to take the those things and in the way we talked about the rapid improvement type approach is in a particular uh, system is um, uh, to embed that into a pathway. So they, they're uh, taking the clinical pathway and designing it based around all of the interventions so that the path it's the pathway that we're then adopting, not each of the um, separate programs. And the bottom piece is very much what the optimum pathway should look like, but will be implemented and owned at the system level. And the ability for us, if we, for instance, on this one, um, uh, if we look at something like uh, ophthalmology, if we embed the different things that we could do, uh, particularly Ryan, you can see there the advice and guidance, patient initiated follow up, uh, the interoperability um, uh, with optometrists and opticians. Um, we have roughly 8 million outpatients at the minute. Um, we can offer a, tra a different way to do that for um, somewhere between a quarter and a third of those patients so that we can do it in a different model. And that's the prize for us. If we move on to the next slide. Um, this is a slide about, um, I, I, it's much, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but it's one which um, uh, uh, Helen Bevan would use a lot, and uh, it's sourced from Henry Tim's New Power. And it's actually about the approach, and it, it goes back right back to the start of what I said, is the old power was, was essentially a sort of top-down um, uh, approach. It was about command and control, uh, authority was held by a few, and it was pushed down into the system. The new power, and, and this is research, um, uh, and Henry Timms talks about um, the sort of new power in the 21st century, but you will also see lots of ac other academic uh, papers and you will see the best organizations in most sectors now are ones which are agile, ones which have empowered staff, ones which have um, clarity about the objective and the outcome that we're wanting to achieve. Uh, but people right throughout the organization delivering on, on objectives much more horizontally. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, which um, in fact you can skip over that one onto the next one, which should be the same one but with an arrow. And this is a slide from uh, I, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, and it actually talks about the journey we've been on around um, and three um, talks about the sort of three levels, the three um, uh, uh, sort of loops in this journey, or three steps in the journey. And almost coming from a culture where we've uh, performance management and heavy assurance, and it's actually about almost retaining power at the centre. And it was very much the noughties and even the nineties uh, that 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 
emerged and, and became very prevalent. We've had a period now over the last five years or so around uh, and longer for some organizations around uh, quality improvement where uh, and what might be described as sharing power um, in organizations where we're trying to what I talked about about trying to empower many more people in the organization. Um, but the third um, step in this journey is very much around how do we actually co-produce and mobilize social action much more with people um patients and staff and if we can move on to the next um slide because that leads me into what i describe as um reciprocal innovation Ooh. and um the the practice if you like of exchanging um insights and, and learning and ideas um for uh virtual um uh, or sort of for for benefit and improvement right across the system and the potential for us to shift the uh, relationship particularly with citizens and to engage citizens which if you relate back to the ihi model is that third curve that they talked about if we could move on to the, uh, I'm sorry, just in the middle of that graphic, you can see the traditional um, sort of innovation led by experts is quite a narrow funnel. It's a typical sort of innovation um, uh, journey. And the one which on the right is one which I'm going to say a little bit more about, um, but is is this idea of, of co-producing and engaging citizens much more. And uh, the idea where you can broaden that funnel and actually uh, engage many more people in the innovation and have greater opportunity for that to be embedded. We, um, in a, if we can move on to the next slide, we used that um, approach with in the early stages of the COVID outbreak um, to uh, look at, in particularly laboratory testing. Uh, how could we upscale our testing, as you will recall, how could you forget, um, the desire to increase our testing levels. Um, and so um, we took a, a, used a platform uh, called crowdsourcing, where we went out quite openly um, and offered with industry, um, with, with some champions um, on a sort of social media platform where people could uh, put their idea in, people could add to it, people could discuss it, people could, and it was a very open platform, it was very agile, and we literally got hundreds of ideas, we'd, we'd five problems we'd set that we needed solutions to, and invited people to come, and if you think about that versus the, the NHS's traditional approach for generating innovations um, and building on them and implementing them, and the result was we had quite a number of those ideas went to went into production within a matter of weeks um, and added to the sort of testing levels that, that we had. So very powerful in terms of um, uh, an agile innovation um, sort of approach. So the next slide I have, which should have a, a picture of Facebook and um, but was this idea of uh, how we can actually increase our reach to citizens um, to create sort of much more around this, what I would term the reciprocal learning. And it was a piece of work again, we did with, with NHS Horizons um, and using what uh, Facebook would call the power administrators or power admins. And by working with um, uh, those 1800 power administrators, we were able to reach uh, 5 million UK citizens um, because of the uh, a power of social media and the ability, but you are not able to control the message and mandate the message as much. It's um, the power administ administrators actually uh, tend to theme that and, and adapt it, uh, but they uh, connect, if you like, you get the message out um, in a way which reaches a, a, a huge amount more people. If I can move on to the, the next slide. Um, and these, this was just really um, some of the results that we had. Uh, there was, um, you know, sort of the extremely positive feedback was uh, sort of vastly outweighed any sort of negative feedback. 
um, people felt that they, the message was much better connected to um, their communities and the communities that feel like they represented or connected with. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, people then felt uh, an awful lot more support at, uh, or man, at minded to support the NHS and felt motivated to do so. And so as a, as a new platform for us moving away from the sort of traditional engagement process, I think there was quite a bit of, uh, of learning, uh, as the title was saying, reciprocal learning. If we could move to the next slide, which I hope if I'm keeping pace with what's on the screen, um, is a picture of a woman called Maureen Bissignano, who's one of my leadership um, sort of, uh, she would be a leadership role model for me. Um, and uh, has, has been involved in improvement work and, and patient safety work for uh, probably uh, over 20 years now and uh, incredibly value-driven leader. But Maureen, one of the things Maureen talks about, uh, which is um, something I agree with very much, is that everyone in healthcare having two jobs, to do your job and to improve the job or the or the service that you're a part of. Not in a heavy duty way, you know, that staff are left feeling, gosh, I have something more to do, but actually that you're feeling you you have the authority, you have the permission, you have the um, space to actually um, add to and improve and make your job safer and better. And it goes back to those 10,000 uh, pairs of eyes and 10,000 minds. Move on to the next slide. I know you were due to have someone to talk about accelerated access collaborative. I'm not going to, other than to say uh, it does exist. I sit on the board and it's a forum which is bringing together industry, government, regulators uh, and the uh, NHS together to try and speed up um, um, innovations and bring innovations and improvements um, to the coalface, to the front line. Uh, much more quickly so that we're um, identifying and uh, scaling um, ad uh, innovations that will help us in a more agile and effective way. If we move on to the next slide, what it looks like, that just gives you some of the, uh, of the, the sort of six main areas that the Accelerated Access um, Initiative is working in. I'm not going to go through those. They're, they're there in the slides. I'm very conscious of time. So, um, I'm just going to finish with um, some final sort of reflections from me. Uh, I think it is very much around how do we create, uh, and uh, I'm not going to go through these, but just to maybe sort of uh, go back even to Neil's question, why did I take this job? Um, I think there is something around how do we create um, uh, across the NHS a culture where um, it is much more aligned with new power, is one where there's a greater agility to improve and to innovate. And uh, we have a sense of the balance between assurance and improvement. And if you like, we're trying to harness the 1.3 million minds and 1.3 million pairs of eyes. Because if we do that, um, delivering on the objectives in this new power model, we will bring innovations. Uh, to the front line and the benefits of those <coughs> innovations and improvements much more effectively um, with all the benefits that we'll get from that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. That's awesome. So um, I think lovely is you can definitely tell that you've done this as a job. So it's not just a lot of uh, theory. You've been at the front line, you've rolled up the sleeves, you know what you're talking about. Um, just I do think the cultural piece is hugely important, that kind of the new power and just people who, as you, you kicked off saying, you know, people are feeling a bit downtrodden and exhausted and asking people to do more. But I think obviously people get a real buzz from, from making a positive change in the system. And I think that, um, you know, we really do need to celebrate people that go the extra mile, you know, and, and really want to make the difference. Um, I just want to flag tomorrow, uh, we have a session at 11 o'clock, so for the people listening, if you scroll down on the, the, to scroll down the screen, you'll see tomorrow at 11, we actually have a group of NHS frontline staff, uh, a, a real mixture of people from medical student through to doctor, to um, uh, talk um, about practically how you go about sharing and, and what are the barriers and what encourages you. So we're looking at that cultural piece from a frontline perspective. And at midday, we have um, 
a team uh, to speak um, about kind of the theory, the theories behind uh, sharing, what, what encourages people. So we've got a digital sociologist, um, a behavioral scientist, um, and some other um, experts to talk about these topics. So those will be really interesting and be, give extra flavor to what Hugh's been talking about. So thank you, uh, Hugh. Um, Rob, I don't know if you've got any, any reflections ahead of your presentation on what, what uh, Hugh just said. Uh, yes, very, very briefly, um, uh, great to listen to Hugh uh, talking about the work of uh, NHS Improvement. So what, what stood out for me was just how vast the challenge is. Mm. Um, the, the task at sort of national level of where to start uh, what structures and process have you got to bring to bear? Um, great that uh, re emphasised as we do in our um, briefings to companies, uh, the number one priority is patient safety. Um, so again, just, just great to hear that sort of message being reflected out. In terms of the poll, I, I had a slightly different view and I was um, reflecting on our sort of role as AHSNs uh, the innovation landscape or an improvement in innovation landscape is huge. Uh, and, and sometimes when you're in dealing with a particular part of it, you have a strong view of your particular perspective. And I'm hoping I'm not going to contradict anything that Hugh said. I, I agree with everything he said. It's just sometimes when we're focusing on, as I will later on, technology, there are slightly different rules occasionally that come into it. My, my thoughts on your poll... Uh, was uh, linking into Hugh's comments about sort of culture. Uh, and in our briefing, we, we refer back to the Health and Care Act of 1990. So we've now had 30 years of what a process that started with that act, which was focused on organisational efficiency. So the main point of that act 30 years ago was to get people to own their organisation. And we've had successive sort of policies, including around trusts and foundation trusts, that have driven the ownership uh, and responsibility for organizations, not systems. So we've done very well at driving up organizational efficiency. Um, and I think now is a good time to look at, and so I think Simon Stevens has had for some time, a vision of how we need to join back up elements of the system, because there are things that when you only focus on your organization, you are less likely to do other things that might bring about um, other benefits. So I think that sort of, is that culture or, or is it just a sort of systemic issue around the structure of the NHS? So I thought that that might be in the poll somewhere. Uh, and then particularly when it comes to technology, but I think not every technology is generalizable everywhere. So Hugh was talking about how a lot of things are generalizable. I think when you come to technology, and the issues around finance affordability, both from an NHS and a commercial perspective, actually doesn't sometimes limit where an intervention will work and, and will be wanted. Uh, again, those sort of subtleties we cover in our briefings and all the bewares, we know what is likely to go wrong with um, interventions. Uh, and we can run through a checklist roughly when we hear what you've got to offer to show you and identify for you uh, as a technology company, where, where you might be frustrated by the NHS. So, enjoy listening to you. Thanks for that. Cool. So, thank you. I mean, I think the, the scale of what, what we're talking about is is immense. You've got 1.2, 1.2, 1.3 um, full time equivalents, and it's a lot of people, a lot of pressure. Um, but obviously, it's all about, you know, it takes, you know, one, two, three, four, five people to start the ball rolling um and so i think it's you know it is a challenge that we can meet um and obviously bob uh, is hoping to make play a small part in that helping people to to uh share their stories and, and everything else so let's have a uh, hand over to rob and his slides so just to let you know hugh i'm informed the slides went beautifully so uh rob you can go uh, confidently into your presentation, knowing the slides should progress in time. So uh, over to you. Uh, thanks again, Neil. So um, <clears throat> today I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, a section of our briefings that we give to companies twice a month. So if anyone is interested in hearing more about the wider offer of HSNs, uh, they'll be starting in, in January. More than welcome. I'm, I'm picking up, in part because of the theme of today, 
um, but also it's a, an important differentiator in terms of the companies we uh, would like to see more of. Talking about what will help you to get to scaling up. So uh, I might talk a bit about pilotitis later on, but we, we do attract in a lot of very early stage uh, innovators, um, but we also have an offer relevant to late stage where companies will still struggle. Uh, and we have, again, some, some insights as to uh, how you may get around some of those challenges, uh, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail. So uh, as the uh, map on the right hand hopefully shows, uh, there are 15 academic health science networks that covers England, uh, and we've been around since 2013. Uh, we have two main national commissions, uh, or three, depending on how you uh, define NHS England improvements. Our main initial commission was from NHS England uh, on general improvement work. We had a very specific commission from NHS improvement around patient safety. Uh, and in the last three years, uh, we've had a commission from the Office for Life Science. And it's that element I'm going to focus on and has more re direct relevance to technology companies. <clears throat> So the Office for Life Science, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a joint office between the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, so the difference between our, that commission and the other commissions is for the OLS commission, it is around the technology. It must be around because they're looking at how do you generate some economic growth through supporting companies, whereas the other two commissions may involve technology but don't have to. The economic growth, for those of you who think this might be around how do we push technology into the uh, NHS, absolutely not. Uh, AHSNs are not uh, performance managers in any way. We raise awareness um, uh, to uh, enlighten people on what might be possible, but we, this comes with no authority. Uh, and, and that economic benefit is only gained if there is local uptake or significant local uptake. So it is still back to local frontline staff who will ultimately make the decision around which technologies to use. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk very, very uh, briefly around our sort of practical approach to this. So we, we see companies of all sizes, shapes, experience, uh, technology types. Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, it's a very general first offer uh, in our briefings. We will give you an insight into some of the challenges of the NHS, what do HSNs do, and how we might signpost to use the different parts of the innovation landscape, including funding opportunities through Innovate UK, collaborations through uh, National Institute of Health uh, Research, for example. Uh, a sense of scale of the work we undertake, two and a half to 3,000 companies a year are getting one-to-one -one support from across the 15 HSNs. About 600 of those are, are working with more than one HSN, and about 200 of them uh, have been working with an HSN for more than two years. Most of our work is one-to-one, -one, uh, and as you might imagine, uh, that's quite expensive, and we have a limited bandwidth. So we do select in um, companies, so we aren't necessarily going to be able to provide uh, in-depth support to every company. If we can go on to the next slide, please. So in terms of our support offer, it's broadly in three or four sort of areas, but starting with the star on the right, the scale up. In terms of what we are after, we're after interventions uh, based around the technology uh, that has the potential to go national, if not international. So um, that might be the first thing we're looking at is what is your potential when you are ready what we know is, and this has come from programs such as the Innovation Technology Programme and Rapid Uptake Programme, um, uh, where companies have specific insights and evidence that they can share in advance, it makes the engagement and adoption process far quicker. So we know what makes uh, your access accelerate. In terms of uh, how do we get there, so that round circle, the circle is really what I'm going to talk about today is uh, elements of rounding off the evidence. What, how do you get to that point where you are going to be able to accelerate earlier stage uh, evidence gathering through NICE, NIHR, other organisations and programmes? We're likely to have a signposting role uh, to help you to find those resources that might help you. And what is all this evidence looking to do? It's looking to validate your claims, your claims as we would try and capture in something we call a value proposition. And throughout your journey, 
from starting off with your value proposition, there'll be other offers around how do we help you understand the business aspect uh, and support you in developing your business planning approach. Uh, next slide, please. So this process around uh, getting enough evidence and insight that's going to help you accelerate uh, to scale up. It, it's a process um, of persuasion. Um, it's less about gathering evidence. It's more about becoming more convincing. How do you give potential users, uh, adopters, buyers the confidence that what you say you your product or service can do uh, is realizable. On the left hand side, there are a range of um, starting points. You might have evidence of an in type of intervention that works and you borrowed your evidence from someone else's intervention. The more convincing evidence will come from when it's been an evaluation around your product. And so we could work through all of those. And if we just go on to that last transition, hopefully at the bottom, you will see told by you on the left hand side and told by peers on the right hand side. The reality is people, um, the message, the value of a message that people carry is influenced by how they perceive you. And for companies, they will perceive you as a vested interest in selling your product. What we ideally want and what I think where Bob Health, uh, as an example, helps so much is capturing the peer to peer story. Peer to peer influence is far more convincing. The language they use, the understanding and insights that comes with how they describe what benefits they've derived from a product or service is just far more convincing. So left hand side will work sometimes, the right hand side is going to work even better. All right, if we go on to the next hand slide, please. Um, in terms of where do you start gathering these evidence and insights? It's somewhere between completing your regulatory requirements and starting to scale up. In fact, your evidence might continue as you're scaling up and beyond. So there isn't a hard and fast, this is where your evidence begins. Um, it's part of your journey. And the important aspect is to be asking uh, the market, uh, people who will use and buy your product, what do they want to hear from others about how effective the product is? It will be a market informed process. It's a judgment based, not a rule based. So if you came to us and said, what evidence do I need? We would encourage you to go and discuss what you have with as wide a group as possible, uh, from patients, uh, their carers, uh, through frontline staff, operational managers, and budget holders. If we go on to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of real world evidence, real world validation, uh, we're more likely to be involved in the right hand side where the scale of the evaluation or the insights being gained is larger and the degree of control is less. So if you're small scale, relatively controlled, it's more likely to be trial orientation, more likely to be looking at the technical details of what does one individual patient get. Where we come in is more around the, how does this work when you use normal services, normal people, in where patients have choice and aren't carefully selected? How does that impact on the benefits that you claim can be realized? And in terms of the role of HSMs, the sorts of things we might be involved in is at the stage that we believe you're ready for that, helping to broker introductions with potential sites. Uh, for some of us, uh, there are about four or five academic health science networks that have in-house teams who will um, uh, undertake some of the analytic work. So we might be involved in a gap analysis of the evidence or insights that will help you. We might be involved in designing some of the questions and processes that will help you to close those gaps. Uh, and for some of us, we may also be involved in undertaking those evaluations. So a spectrum of offers, not offered by all AHSNs, but we know uh, who, who does, so we'll be able to point you in the direction. Some of those that don't will outsource it. So Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network, for example, outsources a lot of its evaluations to the York, Yorkshire and Humber uh, Health Economics Consortium. Um, next slide, please. And, and then just going back to, um, there is a selection criteria. Uh, it's a selection criteria, not just for us and the NHS, but also for you. Uh, we often hear about pilotitis, the repeated requests to ask for another pilot. 
um, just be aware that um, it does happen. It happens for a variety of reasons. But the main question we would ask you in terms of before you set out to undertake an evaluation is, is it going to make a difference to the uptake of your product or service? If it isn't, don't do it. Come and seek advice and uh, look at how we might help you. Is this an indication of the market saying they don't really want you? Is it an indication of the clinicians may really love what you want to do, but they may not be able to afford it? And it's not right or wrong. It's just going in with your eyes open as, is this going to help your business? And we think if we address this one issue, it will reduce the criticism of the NHS around pilotitis. We go on to the next slide, please. The sorts of things that you might therefore produce, uh, bearing in mind you won't get to a real world evaluation until you've got that patient level uh, evidence. Case studies, particularly around the financial information, so uh, budget impact model, not a cost effectiveness, although a cost effectiveness may be important, but from a frontline service, what they'll need to know is how do I afford you? What do I need up front to be able to make this work? And not every organisation will have that upfront cash. Um, anything that might help around the procurement process uh, and so on. So it's not that this all needs to be done because it, you'll have to find out from the market which elements do they need. But this is just a sort of checklist around what might help you. So just in summary, uh, today's a, a snippet of what AHSNs can do to support you, particularly towards that scaling up phase, which we're very interested in doing. Uh, it's part of an existing process that we run. Um, we run briefings twice monthly. You'll find most of your work with Academic Health Science Networks is on a one-to-one -one basis. We share information between us, so it will help you to fill in that form once, and then we can share you more quickly. Uh, and generally, AHSNs are there to help. I uh, look forward to catching up with many of you at some point in the future. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, I'll just pose a question that's come in from um, uh, one of our participants. Um, so they're basically just basically flagging, you know, it's a huge organization that we need to transform, you know, 1.3 million staff, it's a huge undertaking. So there's lots of structures and lots of processes and somebody else sent another question which i've got on whatsapp here around you know there's lots of girth and right care and there's all of these initiatives but how do we really get that cultural transformation and what could maybe all of you know whether we're a, you know a leader in the nhs or a staff member or you work for a pharmaceutical company or an ahsn like what can we do what what can we what can we how can we encourage each other to go the extra mile to make that cultural change. So maybe, Hugh, you're on mute just so that before you speak. Um, but what would be that cultural? How do we? How do we as individuals get? I don't. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, I don't think there's a sort of single simple thing that you do that sort of you know that that the, that you apply a, an intervention and suddenly your cultural culture changes it, it will take time <clears throat> the experience i had in a, a large integrated trust of ten thousand people was it was a journey it wasn't you know we had to we had to go on that journey we had to walk it um and it was through time that the culture changed and that will be similar i think to what we um have to do across the nhs but i think um i think people are crying out for it i think People want to see um, greater devolvement of um, authority, and uh, I think the evidence base is there. Um, when we look at other industries, uh, when you look at, for instance, even the military, you know, the idea of the general standing on the hill commanding, you know, the the very large army of 1.3 million people, um, as an effective way of of you know um, being successful, you know, has gone out decades ago now, and, and business um uh and you know public sector organizations are very similar um we're actually finding that in order to deliver on some of our complex objectives we actually have to work with other partners 
we have to work in a way which I would always describe as horizontal um, accountability and, and responsibility. So that actually to deliver on some of the long-term plan goals, we actually have to work with councils. We have to work with, uh, you know, with social care. We have to work with education. We have to work with police. We have to work with housing. And when we work with those other agencies in a horizontal way to deliver objectives, instead of our much more traditional working up and down through silos to back to a central uh, department and central minister, uh, we're going to be much more likely to be successful. And I think we're starting to see that in some countries who are making better and regions which are making better inroads um, into delivering on um, sort of uh, public health and, and health improvement uh, goals. So for instance, Scandinavian countries, um, Scotland has moved to uh, much more to a system called outcomes based accountability, where actually they have cross cutting objectives that are um, that are cutting across different departments and, and different aspects of society. Northern Ireland has moved to that uh, model and there are other European countries as well. And I think that's the uh, direction we need to head in. But I think from a leadership point of view, we also have to be very clear that we have to <clears throat> uh, we have to model these behaviours. We have to ensure that if we're going to embed the right culture um, and a transformational and improvement culture, then we have to support that. We have to put the framework in place. We have to be... Um, um, resilient and persistent in supporting it. Uh, I had an old boss and mentor who, you know, used to talk about um, leadership is is um, you know sort of ninety five percent perspiration and five percent inspiration, um, because actually embedding a different culture, it is about being relentless in terms of reinforcing and and uh, that that's the way we're going to do things, but also being authentic to it that we don't say we're going to have a bottom-up culture, but um, then the first time we have a sort of um, a crisis or an issue which isn't being delivered, that we revert to command and control. Um, and I, I think we, we've to learn those new behaviours and it will take time. Uh, but I think, I mean, there's very clear um, uh, intent at the sort of board level at national level to want to make that journey. I think quite a number of people who've been appointed have come from that sort of background or that belief or that value system. And I think that's a direction. And we've seen that, I think, reinforced over the last six months in the response to COVID where place-based uh, responses, you know, have been agile and effective. And uh, we've seen a lot of the innovations that have happened through COVID that we've we've captured in our beneficial changes network um, have actually been because people at a local level are clear on what the, the overriding purpose is and the objective, but have actually had much more freedom on the high. Yeah, that's amazing. So allowing people to, to make some mistakes um, obviously, with patient safety being a big caveat that you've got to be, that's where you've got to be careful on. But, um, uh, and I think I would say that I think it's about helping people telling stories of failure is really, really important because um, if people are willing to be brave and, and talk about where they went wrong or what they might do differently, that's really going to help the next person along the line as opposed to everyone portraying everything they've done as an award entry and everything being perfect. And therefore, no one's picking up on those little nuances, which would make each further implementation um, a little bit better. So, Rob, um, anything you want to add? And then we're going to come to a wrap because we're nearly at the end. I think uh, Hugh covered uh, the vast majority of, of, of uh, what, what uh, needs to happen. Uh, I think the, the the bit I would emphasise, because it's pertinent to our role, uh, picking up on it, it, it's the responsibility of leaders to enable. So I think that is their role. It's there to enable and to support. But some of that is also around uh, making sure people can understand the wider situation. So uh, giving the context for what's going on. And the small bit we offer to do in that process is in enabling through awareness. So raising awareness of what is possible uh, is an important enabler. So giving people insight, telling people what can be done, showing people what can be done. Uh, our experience in the last nine, nine months of COVID is uh, the, the idea that the NHS is slow to adopt, absolutely not. 
uh, when there is opportunity, when you enable people to do things, it happens very quickly and very effectively. So I think it is around that enabling. Uh, but, but the reality, and again, the emphasis I would put on this for commercial companies who are selling products, uh, it is a cash constrained system. So not everything is possible immediately. Uh, telling people how the, the benefits will be realized from an investment is part of your challenge as a commercial company uh, of which we can help. So enabling, but ultimately it sits with leaders to support that enable, enablement. Awesome, so thank you very much. Just a quick little update on the poll. Um, interestingly, uh, we obviously didn't have the cultural uh, elements in there. We'll do that for the next one. Uh, but one of the, the, the thing that got uh, about, if I'm getting the colours right, two thirds of the results is there's no standard way to share. So people just don't, don't know how to do it. Maybe they should look at Bob. Anyway, that's uh, for another day. So um, chaps, thank you so much for um, joining us. We have overrun. So thank you everyone for hanging on. Um, I just want to um, thank you and Rob again. Um, we are going to play a little video um, as we say goodbye. Um, so the first time I spoke to uh, Hugh, um, he talked about that, well, that point he made earlier around um, us need to sort of being um, the harvesters. So it's the adopters. We should be celebrating the adopters, not just the innovators. Um, so, um, and he mentioned this, he, he said, do you remember that clip from a long time ago that went around uh, on the um, email. It was even early days of social media. So 2009, you might recall um, a, a clip with a guy dancing on a hill. Um, he's at the um, Sasquatch uh, Music Festival in the US. There's a singer called Santa Gold singing a song called Unstoppable. And um, you see this lovely man dancing and then slowly the crowd comes together and um, Hugh sort of flagged that to me. So I think that's what we need to celebrate is people coming together us all being unstoppable when it comes to um, uh, improvement and adopting innovation. So um, we'll say goodbye and um, play the video. It was probably on an iPhone 4. The sound's a bit scratchy. Uh, it's a bit, uh, bit wobbly, but it, you will get an adrenaline rush, I promise, if you watch it to the end. It's a two and a half minute clip. So thank you very much from all three of us and uh, take care. Have a good evening.